very excited tonight is, um, you know, this could be a, a great discussion specifically about a uh, new platform. Um, so, uh, Dr. Dan Ford, right? Um, so, if you'd like to just give us a, just a quick uh, intro about yourself and how you got to be the CTO uh, for Blackboard. Well, it's the, wow, it's really kind of loud. Um, Chief Security Officer, not the CEO. I would definitely not want to be the CEO. Uh, <laughs> that means I don't get to play with any cool things. Um, so I was the Chief Security Officer pr um, previously at this company called Fixmo, which recently got bought by Good Technology, which happened to deal a lot in device integrity. If you're familiar with the Samsung Knox product line, um, the integrity services piece in there, um, Fixmo wound up uh, being quite heavily used in that area. And so um, Good bought them, been there, bought that t-shirt. No way in hell was I going back to that. Um, so I met the guys at Silent Circle um, probably about two years ago. And they had this, this notion that encryption solves everything. And I said, well, in a lot of ways, yes. But when you're looking at it from a bad actor perspective, we're always going to go where it's not encrypted. And when you start talking about voice communications, you have this small little thing called a microphone. And you can tap into the microphone if you're not worried about the actual device integrity and determining whether or not the device has been popped at a given moment. And um, Phil Zimmerman was, was in this particular conversation. And he was quite interested. Um, used some choice words to get some people out of the room after I was starting to describe this. And um, eventually they did leave, and Phil and I got to have a conversation about how this would occur. Kind of explained to him an RSA attack, or R at RSA conference, I guess now about three years ago, by George Kurz and Dmitry Alperovich from CrowdStrike, um, which would utilize um, some techniques that would go into memory booking um, and the way in which you could just grab things off the, the microphone, store it, send it out later. Um, of course, this requires a, com you know, a compromised device. Compromised devices are not that difficult to find, um, especially if it's Android, because, well, at any given moment, it could be compromised as soon as you check the box to allow untrusted sources. So, Fixmo sold the good. Uh, Mike Jenke, CEO for Silent Circle. So, Silent Circle um, is the majority stakeholder in Blackphone, and actually, I'm the chief security officer for both companies, um, which is um, good and bad, <clears throat> but because they, they, and it's never fun to have a Navy SEAL that was on SEAL Team 6 say he just wants one throat to choke from a security perspective. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's, never, that's never too much fun. Um, so um, he said, hey, I'd like you to come be the, the CSO over here. What's it going to take? And I'm like, well, yeah, this is exactly what my dissertation was on, was the, you know, how we could continue to improve the privacy and security of smart device, and this is, uh, I get this question quite a bit. How can you say your phone is the most secure and most private? Well, security is relative. Relative to something and compared to something. So we can say it because as of this moment, we still have no, every single publicly uh, known vulnerability in Android in our product is patched. No other Android manufacturer today can say that. Um, so that's one way we can say it. You can also, you know, the proof is kind of in the pudding. Um, we've patched vulnerabilities in, and have it pushed out in an over-the-air update in less than 48 hours. So again, we control the release cycle. We don't, con we're not concerned ourselves with the particular carrier. So if we can patch more quickly than everyone else, then we can also say that we're in a much better security profile than anyone else. So again, it goes back to the what are you going to compare it to and what's it relative to? So in, uh, in preparation for uh, this conversation, I, I noticed that uh, Phil Zimmerman mentioned that um, in the past couple of years, the hardware caught up uh, with the, I guess, requirements for privacy and so on. And maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, I mean, you guys did a very impressive uh, feat of, of basically um, yeah, building, a whole, yeah, building a whole platform in a, uh, you know, a private OS in four months and launching it. Uh, maybe we can talk about that process, and also, um, like I said, what does it mean about uh, you know hardware catching up? That'd be great. Sure. So, um, well, <clears throat> kind of the history of what occurred 
you know, after, you know I, I would like to take credit for this, but I'm probably sure it was just one of many that told them this. If you want to say, you know, you have to control the entire platform uh, if you're going to have a shot at providing secure communication. Um, so they went out to this organization called Geekstone, which is out in Spain, that has been making the Ubuntu phone, Firefox phone, and some other niche phones in, in Europe. So they we kind of like what they have to say. And they had the connection to the manufacturing, so we were able to very quickly, um, utilizing NVIDIA to make the entire chipset, um, but we had to had to work our ass off. I mean, that's really what it came down to, was blood, sweat, and tears. Um, you know, everyone was focused, everyone knew that we wanted to do this. And again, that Navy SEAL guy, there's actually four other Special Forces people that work in that organization. Um, you know, you don't want them to be, you know, choking you out. So we kind of uh, said, okay, let's 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 do this. It, it's it's amazing to see when a group of people are dedicated to a common goal. It's you know, if you can think it, you can you can build it, and that's what we set our minds to do. So we promised the industry at Global World Congress, which was February, uh, that in June we would ship phones. On June thirtieth. We started shipping the phones to Europe. July 17-ish, we started shipping the phones to North America. Um, the second part, the hardware aspect. Yeah, I mean, hardware changes every three months. So, you know, we, we launched with a uh, um, one gig of memory. Um, but just like in a lot of programming, we, we decided to start fine-tuning the performance aspects because a lot of developers um, will just, hey, I've got, I can do 16 gigs of memory. I can, I, there's going to be bigger processors, but that also means battery. So battery is, uh, is the most precious material in any phone, because no one wants to be, you know, like these phones I saw over here earlier, no one just wants to be plugged in all the time, because then you're really not that mobile. So we started trying to fine tune um, each of the processes and shut things down that didn't need to be on, like Wi-Fi, um, which is one of the key advantages as well. Um, I mean, how many know that you can just be tracked by your Wi-Fi, right? Okay, good. So you know, you're, you know, we're all we're kind of taught, hey, data is precious, so connect any Wi-Fi. Forget to turn off that Wi-Fi radio. You're constantly beaconing out for, you know, every single SSID you've ever connected to with your MAC address. I find that interesting. Um, I spent some time just, you know, academically speaking, at certain Starbucks in DC to see how many MAC addresses continuously repeat uh, during certain times and which SSIDs they've connected to. Since having spent the majority of my career working in the US federal government, um, I know where some of those SSIDs are. So if I know it. I'm not that smart, so that means other people know. So, um, Silent Circle and uh, Black Phone, more just about uh, just about uh, encrypted voice communication, right? I mean, you do offer uh, encrypted cloud uh, storage space, uh, secure SMS, and so on. Um, and also, I was reading that there, you know, there are also other products uh, in mind or, or down the road. I mean, what's your opinion about uh, IoT and security and privacy? So it goes back again, you know, secure compared to what and relative to what. Um, I like to knock Apple, so I think it's pretty easy to be secure when you're using Apple devices. Because we see that they're really not a security company. They may play one on TV and in the marketing world, but any security company would have a you know a lockout policy on their cloud environment. That's that's security 101. You know, am I gonna allow 30,000 attempts at uh, the account authentication credentials and no one know it. There's this new thing called throttling. Someone may want to let them know about that. <laughs> um, so, um, internet, the Internet of Things, it's, it's, again, it's going to be based on what is your risk threshold, what are you willing to share, who are you willing to trust? Um, are you willing to trust Google? Some plenty do. You willing to trust Amazon? 
Apple, Microsoft. Um, some of the laws are kind of interesting to me right now that's going on. Microsoft came out and said any email is their business record. Kind of maybe coming back to haunt them, um, especially with some of the recent you know, cases that are going on. Um, so privacy, again, is only seems to be as much of an issue as it's in the news. Um, it, it's, a, it's a way of life. If you're willing to share everything, then you know, expect to have no privacy. I kind of look at the internet, internet of things. If you're willing to to broadcast out, you're willing to be on the internet. I don't look that. I look at that as being walking down the street that anywhere. You're in public. You have no expectation of privacy. But as soon as you turn on encryption, to me, that's the proverbial phone booth. You know, at that point, you're saying I, I want some privacy. Uh, and to the, in the traditional smartphone environment, you don't um, have an option to choose what you're going to share or what you're not going to share. It's an opt-in or um, nothing at all. You can't selectively go down and say, I'm willing to share my address book because I don't care if my friends get, get compromised. Um, or you're willing to share your photos or you're willing to share your GPS data. So with Blackphone, one of the first things that we did, with, and it's not that I want to make this a marketing pitch, but I think it's pretty important, you know, Google in um, 4.2 of the Android release had a way of um, selectively doing permissions, but it broke a lot of things. And so they quickly and quietly took that out um, because they couldn't figure out how to patch it. We did. We patched it forward, um, and that's one of the core concepts of what we have in there. You can selectively choose which permissions you want for any single app that you put on there. Today, Google Play is not on there. We don't have Google services. But you can still put on the Amazon App Store, you can put on any of the other third-party Android app stores. We'll have our own conservatively you know, first quarter. Um, we are inviting particular apps that ones that we will go through and take a look at. But you know, I've got on my black phone Twitter, no problem. Um, Facebook works fine. All the permissions turned off. So um, it still works. That's one of the things. If you go in and root your Android device and go and change the permission model, a lot of times these apps will just crash because they're saying if you don't have X, then don't, you can't work. So what we did was basically utilize the SE Android profiles that are in there and said, hey, I want access to your camera. Yeah, sure, you can have access to your camera. Well, give us your pictures. Ah, uh, yeah, we don't take pictures. That's basically the kind of way in which we told them. Hey, we want access to your address book. Sure. Well, where are your names? Well, we don't know anyone. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the way in which, which we've done this. So we're, we're choosing um, to put security and privacy back in your hands. You choose which risk profile you're willing to, to use. Um, we want you to be our customer, not our product. And I think everywhere else you're the customer and the product. And I think that's, that's a huge discrepancy between where, what our business model is and the rest of the uh, smartphone community. So let's say uh, just one last question before we turn into uh, the Q&A. Um, you know, it's almost like a perfect storm. You know, it seems like almost every week there's a uh, new incident. Uh, so it started with the Snowden, um, you know, release to the public saying that there's some sort of surveillance or government-sponsored, um, you know, tracking. And then, uh, you know, just recently, in this past week, uh, we heard about uh, some towers that just popped up. Um, so really perfect storm for you guys, and I think that uh, the first uh, platform was sold out right at the beginning. Um, maybe you can talk about a little bit about um, you know how you came from, uh, from a company that was uh, specifically uh, responsible for uh, providing you know a few people the private the private phones to uh, you know the forefront of, of, of uh, consciousness here uh, in, in, uh, in public uh, opinion as well. Yeah, so it's great NSA Network to have kind of done our marketing for us. Um, whether or not you believe he's a, a hero or a traitor um, is, isn't as important as some things were being done that possibly should not have been done. Um, we definitely know that Edward Snowden is somewhere in Russia, and he's definitely putting out information that kind of, um, you know, at least led everyone to believe that privacy has been compromised. Um, and that part of that comes into the technology. People, most people don't understand the technology. Um, I would say people that you know, my you know, grandparents were not as necessarily wanting to share all their private information. 
Um, my father still today doesn't, doesn't have a smartphone, um, doesn't text. Um, and it's kind of funny to me because he's the one that taught me about computers. And so now the, you know, the tables have kind of turned. Um, and, and recently, this is, this is what, I, I get this question quite a bit when it comes to the big cell towers. Um, when you're looking at security, you, you have, it's, not, it's not just about whether or not there is a, a particular vulnerability or exploit. It's the probability that the threat actor has the capability to exploit that vulnerability. So the recent reports say there's anywhere between 15 and 19 fake cell towers that have been found. There's 304,000 roughly cell towers in, in the United States. So I'm not that great at math, but I think that's something like you know one one millionth of a percent or some uh, really silly number. Basically, it comes down to um, you've got a better chance of winning an Oscar than uh, being compromised by a fake cell tower. Um, I was hoping it would be like eaten by a shark. I thought that was pretty cool, but that's like one in eleven and a half million. So um, I couldn't come up with that stat. But it's um, there are some crazy stats because I was really trying to find. Well, what are some of the stats? What's, what's the likelihood? Um, my marketing people refuse to let me use the morbid ones, but there are, um, if you want to know, you can ask David, because I told him. So, uh, we, we look, if you want to try to protect against that one, one millionth of a percent, the, the one, it comes down to one in 15,000, basically, or 15,000 one. Again, I'm not that good at math, so, whichever way the odds work out better. Uh, then you can go out and buy plenty of phones that cost about $3,500 that have you know, two different SIM chips in it. One SIM chip that is still an at and TT Mobile, the other SIM chip which is going to kind of monitor the other one. Monitor, does not block. So it just lets you know that your, your, you know, your data uh, was compromised. We tend to look at things at every network is compromised. So if you assume that you're compromised, you assume the bad guy's in, how are you going to somewhat protect that? And that's where the silent circle piece is coming. You know, it is, uh, an asymmetric encryption architecture. Um, you exchange the keys. We actually have it, it's basically zero knowledge. So from the silent circuit perspective, you better know who you're talking to because we don't. So we don't, we don't, you can actually pay for silent circle with Bitcoin if you want it. So we don't collect customer data. If you choose not to give us an email address, I just hope you don't have any customer service problems because we're not gonna be able to help you if you, you know, in that particular case. But there are plenty of people that say, my name is Bob123. Um, or any other um, pseudonym that they come up with. Um, so hopefully you know who it is that you're talking to because you're going to be exchanging public keys with them. And so if you're going to have that voice communication and it really wasn't you know, your friend Bob, then your communication was compromised. But if you want to use the carrier network, assume everyone is listening. Um, if you have that assumption, then you use the silent circle aspect. Or you know, any other secure voice communication. But it comes down to price. Our phone is $629. And I feel that we have provided a sufficient countermeasure against the fake cell towers. Um, if you don't think that's true, there's plenty of phones out there for $3,500 or more. I would rather spend my $3,500 on something else. So, any, any questions? Uh, yeah, so, um I just found out about your company on this presentation, so this question might not be uh, uh, extremely brilliant, but your business model, uh, why, why did you choose to sell smartphone as opposed to software that could be downloaded on any, any Android phone and provide the same functionality? Time to market, easy to buy, was there a technical challenge in doing that, or? So let me just uh, repeat the question. The question was specifically around why go with the, uh, the phone path, or the hardware, not just the software path. So I actually just know a little bit about that. So the fact is, uh, the problem with the uh, not controlling the platform, the Simon Circle had a software only, and it still does. So you can download it on your phone and run Simon Circle, but there's something to be said about actually um, owning that platform, which okay. uh, so there's, there's a couple aspects. There's actually some article I saw out there was a do-it-yourself black phone. Because our, our kernel is open source. You just can't do it for profit. Now, that does not include things like the, the bootloader being locked. 
because some of that is in partnership with like NVIDIA. Um, NVIDIA will not allow that to be open source. So we made open source everything that we're able to make open source. Um, things when you start you know, controlling the platform, controlling um, that security aspect, if, if, you were, if we were to give you some things to try to log in, because you could, you could go out and get um, the Cyanogen mod and do quite a bit, but then that maybe not everything is going to work properly, um, or at least to your particular way that you want it to work. So I kind of look at it from a, it's a, it's a, it's a function of time. So how much is your time worth to you to try to make things work well? Um, I don't like to believe my time is worth a lot. I wouldn't try to do this myself. So if you think it's going to take you five hours, um, you say you're going to pay yourself 200 bucks an hour, you're going to pay 629 and you're ahead 400 bucks. Um, it's kind of the way I look at it. When I was doing my dissertation, I also knew it was a function of time. It was going to approximately take me around 22,000 hours to, to write. So um, everything comes back down to how much is your time worth. That 22,000 hours could be spread across Four years for you spread across, you know, a couple months. Um, same thing with building a phone. I'm, I feel like I'm pretty, pretty good, but I would try to build a phone myself. Um, now, again, it's about where you feel your risk is. If you're comfortable with uh, the iPhone model, great. If you're uh, comfortable with Android and you want some additional features on there, Cyanogen mod. Um, if you want more, you know, if you take a look at it. You go out and buy an Nexus Five, it costs you about. You know, three, four hundred dollars, um, and then you want to put some additional things on there. You know, you're going to be over that thousand dollars. Ours is you know six twenty nine unlocked, and uh, take it anywhere in the world you want. Yeah, back there. Yeah, if if you're uh, so concerned about privacy and, uh, and 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 those sorts of issues, are you generally against? The notion, and this is an IOT uh, kind of meeting, uh, against things letting or oh, you letting things know where you are in a particular neighborhood or a location, uh, any kind of location based technology, you got to allow your device to kind of be found. So, are you totally against that uh, sort of uh, uh, use of uh, mobile devices? So for those that hear the question, the question happened to be, um, are we having to be against, this is Internet of Things, um, and are we against privacy because of all the different connected devices? I would say quite the opposite. We're in uh, just, we want people to have um, responsible you know, disclosure and understand what level of privacy they're willing to, uh, to give up or to have based on the advantages of the technology. So you can still take our black phone and you can add, turn on every single permission that you want. There's still advantages in that you can still have secure voice um, text communication. You can um, you get to selectively choose what you want to share, when you want to share it, and we'll tell you what you're sharing. Um, because we think that's where a lot of the problem is. People don't have the current capability to select what they want to share. I don't have any issue with the Internet of Things. I have an issue if they can't selectively choose what they want to share. You want to make your home run better? You want to have a, a more efficient car and be able to take a look at things? Great. But you should be able to choose when and where and how you share your data. And once you make a select, is it forever? Can you turn it on or off? That's it's, 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 you can go back at any given time. You can choose, so like for example for me, um, there are certain times I, I want people to think I'm in Switzerland, so I make it look like I'm in Switzerland. <laughs> um, and there's sometimes that I'm okay, but I can tell you, I don't want certain social media to know that I'm at home when I'm doing something. I don't want them to know where my home is. I can go into my um, photos and turn off all the, uh, the XF data, so that way if something comes out, they don't know that it's a black phone. They don't know the geolocation information in there. Because once you release that particular piece of information, it's, you no longer get back control of it. So you know, it's gonna have that kind of information there. It comes back down, we just want you to be aware of what you're sharing um, and have the ability, again, to, to not be the fraud unless you choose to be a fraud. Well, thank you very much. Uh,